Welcome to my video on the Gemini 4 Ed White Spacewalk and the four 4-on-4 four four Speedmaster watches used for that mission. I will cover a lot of information which will also help explain why Omega picked this as their new Steel 321 Speedmaster. I have used a lot of details and thanks to NASA and various air and space museums for the raw files. Also a big shout out to Moonwatch Universe, Philip Moonwatch Universe, who gave me access to his archives and records to help make this. You might need to pause some of the frames to read the text if you want all of the detailed information. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. So Gemini 4 was the first time Amiga realized they'd been selected following tests by NASA Jim Regan as an approved, uh, the only approved for manned spaceflight uh, watch for NASA. Uh, you can see from the images here that there were clearly four Speedmaster watches flown on Gemini 4, one on each wrist for Jim McDivitt two on the left wrist for Ed White for his spacewalk. That was primarily because he wanted to use the handheld maneuvering unit. He also didn't wear one of his thermal gloves for that same reason, which was lost when he opened the capsule, as you'll see later on. I've reversed some of these images just to show a better view of the watches, and we'll come on to why and the importance of time. You can see here the relative size of the capsules, and this was all building from Mercury to Gemini through Apollo through to the Moon mission. We shouldn't forget Alexei Leonov, who was the first man to walk in space in March 65, before uh, Ed White in the four, on the 4th of June 65. And Leonov nearly died in, uh, in his attempt, and uh, the Gemini 4 guys had a lucky escape as well, which we'll come on to. Uh, the doors look quite easy to open on the ground, Everything was tested, everything was checked. Uh, there was a vacuum chamber where the crew of Gemini 3 practiced. And uh, initially for Gemini 4, they were talking about just a stand-up EVA, not even leaving the capsule fully. The, the risk of opening a door in space, of depressurizing. And in a vacuum chamber, uh, John Young, an uh, amazing guy, great astronaut, he, he tested that procedure and actually suggested some modifications with additional handles to help. So everything was practiced and, and that became critical. And here we see Gus Grissom and John Young who from Gemini 3 were setting their scenes. The suit design, everything was followed through in great detail. Um, you know, it, it just looks like a suit, but you know, there's so many valves in things to consider, the uh, handheld maneuvering unit, which was a gas gun to enable Ed White to maneuver himself in the vacuum of and the uh, zero gravity environment. Also the umbilical cord, so that carried electricity, oxygen communications, and a tether. You can see how small the capsule was, you know, four days in space, the amount of complexity not to damage anything and to be able to store equipment. These are brave young guys, proud of what they're doing. Uh, and, you know, just when you consider they're the size of capsule, interesting with the mission patch, uh, they were the first people to wear stars and stripes. The mission patch was created afterwards. They wanted to call the capsule the American Eagle. Back then they didn't, they'd stopped allowing capsule names. So they went with the USA flag on their shoulder. Uh, subsequently, there was an American Eagle, Eagle patch made uh, as a tribute. And there's just another picture of the cockpit. You know, you're living in there and carrying out all bodily functions. Uh, they trained together. They were at test pilot school together. Uh, these are friends, colleagues, professionals, uh, great team spirit. A nice one. I mean, many of these images have been taken from the Moon Watch Universe uh, collection, but uh, nice one there showing the, the watch. And here we are getting into the mission. A lot of astronauts involved working together. Clearly, the two Speedmasters on the left arm here of Ed White as he's getting ready, and then is the two Ed and the Jim McDivitt are walking out onto the pad. And in a lot of these pictures in close-up, you can actually begin to see the times the watches were set to. Th there's also the gold visor, gold over visor being uh, worn for the spacewalk, and some low-res images here, but you can see that it is possible to make out time on the watches. Uh, I do like this one. You can see a bit of a reflection in the gold visor of the launch, and you can clearly see the four watches again. One on each wrist, McDivitt, 
two on the left wrist for um, Ed White again because of the manoeuvring unit later on and there's just a close-up there where you can see the launch tower and uh, his friend reflected the capsule you know is a bit of a tin can a nice nice shot of the two two watches on uh, Ed White and I'll, I'll come up to a timeline on this and possibly why so many watches why was time so important they tested everything including how the door mechanism worked and there's some notes here Jim McDivitt they couldn't shut the door after the spacewalk they could have died Jim McDivitt managed to reset that door and save their lives and reseal and they kept all the equipment the reason we have all the equipment is they were supposed to throw it away they didn't want to open the door again because without that door shut they can't pressurize the capsule they can't re-enter its atmosphere they're dead so that's kind of the what they're living with in bravery so Amiga after this mission because of all the publicity life magazine you can see the advert there they recognized a single speedmaster and it, the fact it was being used in space but if you go to the inside of the magazine the close-up shots clearly showed two speedmasters nice model here again from Moonwatch Universe thanks to Phil um, just a little note there was an auction of one of the cards they used everything was timed everything was monitored but let's just in Enjoy the launch now and there's some video of that. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Lift off. Right. Roll program completed and exhibit report. And the pitch program has been initiated. Roger, flight, we're go. He's got some uh, nice elevated rates, which we expected, and uh, he's, he's really speeded it up, but he looks great. Okay, I'm separate from the spacecraft. Okay, separate from the spacecraft. Right. Roger, Roger, Roger. Okay, my feet are up. I think I'm dragging a little bit, so I don't want to fire the gun yet. Okay, I'm out. Okay, he's out. He's close to me. Okay, I'll put a little roll in, took it right out. Okay. <laughs> Ryan, you did, Jimbo? Four days, four watches, Gemini 4, and I like to call this the Gemini 4. Two watch salute from Ed White. Okay, I rolled out and I'm rolling to the right now. Under my own influence. There goes a. Looks like a thermal blast, Jim. Yeah. It is, it is. Alright. Now I've come across the space draft. I'm coming back down now. I'm under my own control. Okay, I'm coming over. It looks beautiful. I feel like a million dollars. I'm coming back to you. The gun, the gun works real good, Jim. I'm coming back down on the spacecraft. Listen, it's all the difference in the world with this gun. When that gun was working, I was maneuvering all around. Let me get a picture of it. Uh, yeah. No, not now. I'm out of it. You've got about five minutes. I will let myself go out now. Jimmy Ford, Houston. You know, Ed, the thing about the reference you were talking about looks like it's your right. Hey, you don't even need one. Jimmy Ford, Houston, Capcom. Yes, this is Jim. Uh, what? Any memory scores? The flight director says get back in. Ah, okay. The flight director says get back in. Ah, okay. Amazing video and audio there, and you can clearly see the two speedmasters on Ed White's left wrist. There's a transcript here with some details on the mission timing, which I'll come on to. Just thinking about Castor and Pollux, the Wasp aircraft carrier where they were recovered, the Gemini twins, uh, amazing uh, professionals, friends, and colleagues. The relief they must have felt when they were uh, safely down, 
and being recovered to the helicopter and you can see Ed White there still with his two Speedmasters on after the four days of the mission uh, you know just to be back safe in in the blue sea uh, seeing the earth in all its glory have it, but also maybe relief tinged with regret having viewed the earth from above and un understanding their place in the universe and you know how much we have here to hold on to so uh, yeah a, a, a great mission they were celebrated all around the world and i think this also is another reason why amiga have picked this for the 321 release uh, in terms of orbits you know 66 orbits traveling very fast rapid changes from day to night tr rapid changes in location uh, i took this from the net showing the different time zones and uh, you know the alpha codes for the different time zones so there was a lot time was very central to the mission they did have other clocks and as it says here a gmt clock had been added to the console already but they had no ground elapsed time and there was a lot of confusion it was the first time uh, mission control had moved to houston uh, and there was confusion around gmt uh, alpha time which is military time gmt plus one uh, local time uh, there were some errors I don't think they affected the mission but you can see in this transcript which I've edited down for the early stages uh, there were errors in the time calls um, maybe transcript errors but I think some were actual errors in terms of mixing GMT with alpha and when you plot those times based on photos of the actual watches you start to see that they probably were set wrong uh, and I think fundamentally they were trying to use GMT as a main timer and then GMT plus one military time and then the chrono is a ground uh, mission mission elapsed time uh, the watches where are they now so here's an example uh, from John Young at the Smithsonian from Gemini 10 lovely 321 movement uh, in terms of the ones from the actual Gemini 4 mission um, there is a uh, letter which uh, should come up shortly yeah uh, so chrono Maddox, chrono maddox really famous guy sadly no no longer with us huge amount of research on his website it shows a letter which uh, shows a collector in japan bought one watch uh, from the ed white family uh, which is stated to have survived the apollo one fire but i'll come on to that but it looks like a japanese collector is owning one of the watches that was worn on the spacewalk uh, one of the watches worn by Jim McDivitt, because it was not many of the 105003s, the initial ones issued to NASA, that was used by Frank Borman subsequently on Gemini 7. So that was actually Jim McDivitt's watch, which was serial number four. The Apollo 1 crew, sadly all killed in a fire, hopefully that was mercifully quick. Um, I don't believe the watch survived that fire, but either way, I, you know, one of those watches ended up with the family um, whether it was worn during the Apollo one or not, I don't know. The other one, uh, there's an interview with Jim James Jim Regan, uh, saying that all the other um, uh, items from the Apollo one fire were disposed of at a Nike missile site. They were buried, so uh, that watch is probably lost. Uh, one still survives in Japan. One is probably buried, as it was so badly damaged in the Apollo one fire. And we know the Jim McDivitt one um, serial number four is uh, in the Smithsonian uh, and Amiga have obviously picked this this watch the 105003 the um, I've just done a little double heart shot there uh, and uh, you know that's why I think they picked this watch because of how much it means and how central it was to the mission it was the first time that they were used by NASA and uh, yeah I, I, I still like to think of the left wrist to Amiga salute and uh, I'll just let our friend Ed White sign off. Thank you for watching.